Uh, I retired from USIA in 1991. I mention that because it was uh, the era when satellite dishes were first being installed on embassies and cultural centers, and Facebook hadn't even been thought of. Uh, and I heard a lot this morning about metaphoric uses of the last three feet, and I'm wondering if there's any or much actual uh, use of that in the age of fortress embassies. That is, how easy is it and how often is it that PD officers actually get out and talk with editors, chat with them, meet students at universities, take lecturers, and all the things we used to do. Uh, I'm not a Luddite. I'm on Facebook every day. Uh, but I'm just curious about that real direct personal relationship. And I, I don't really mean in a war zone like Iraq, but in, in most countries. I'd say one thing, you get out as much as you want. Uh, say when I served in Istanbul, we had one of those new fortress uh, consulates uh, a bit out of town, but you just get in the car and you go with it. And maybe meeting downtown, if you, you I, I lived halfway downtown, scheduled from the morning to the evening, so maybe it cuts down some of your travel time, but you get out as much as you want. I, I, don't, I don't see these new buildings as much of a, a block as some of the, the critics do. I, I think, in fact, they, they give you a secure base, so you don't have to worry about that but you, you just get out as you want, uh, as you feel you need to. All the more reason to pick the right officers to go out there who can lead these efforts who want to get out. And I would just make one comment about uh, sort of the, the really tougher places like Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, I think one of the great investments that the State Department made in their provincial reconstruction teams in, in both countries was ensuring that in addition to having econ officers and political officers, that all of these teams had public diplomacy officers. Uh, and so my year, my first year in Iraq, I was out four times a week. And, you know, and sometimes, you know, my wife and, and the RSO were not thrilled about this, but, you know, I'd take off my body armor, leave it in the Humvee, go into a restaurant and meet with students um, and have those really, the last three inch, forget the feet, the last three inches interaction, which was so critical. Um, so it, it does happen. Not as often as we'd like, but, uh, but it does happen. Two more quick questions. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, Adam Nixon with Al Hora TV. And uh, I, I know a number of people on this panel are working in countries where we're broadcasting, so uh, thank you for your good work. Um, I wanted to start with just a theoretical question and then put some context. Um, specifically, uh, in Orientalism, uh, Edward Syed talks about hegemony and how when we, when we label us and them or East and West or Oriental and Occidental, we're creating... Uh, hegemony, and then I think specifically and more troubling in our work is that he says that uh, cultural institutions become the tool of that hegemony, right? Uh, and how do we, uh, when we're making our content or when we're talking to people in, in these uh, countries and, and in these societies, how do we make sure that we are uh, being uh, less, hegemon hege less hegemonic and more collegial? Like how do we, how do we make sure that our, our content is uh, engaging in a way that's not colonial. Uh, and uh, specifically, I'll, I'll give context. Uh, we, we, um, we deal with Facebook a lot as well. And we just uh, last week posted a poll on our Facebook page. And when we posted it, I thought to myself, I hope I get 50 comments. I hope I get something back that I can use in a, in a talk show. Uh, the poll specifically was, uh, which is worse, anti-Semitism in the, uh, the Arab world, anti-Islamism in the West, or are they equal? And uh, within 24 hours, we got 12,000 responses, which was, you know, stunning, stunning. We were stunned by the, the, the sheer amount of volume. So in that context, how does all of this connect? Thank you. Anything? I mean, I know it's a difficult. It's, we deal with it every day, right? Walter, maybe you as the senior okay. person. <laughs> <laughs> senior instrument of hegemony, you could say. <laughs> not enough of it. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not a big fan of Edward Said. I think he got it completely wrong. So uh, uh, I, I don't think you have to worry about things like coming off as hegemic or uh, anything like that. You basically go out and do your job and, and push your country's interests forward. And, and don't be sensitive, obviously, to local culture. But I don't think we have to be ashamed of anything that we're trying to promote the United States. Uh, I still think we have the best vision for the world. I think we're the most internationalist. Certainly, if you look at our immigration policies, we're the most generous in the world. So I don't think we have anything to be ashamed about. And, and I, I reject the way he, he looks at the world. Uh, 
So I think if you basically do your job uh, uh, and, and use a lot of the public diplomacy tools, you, you overcome a lot of these things that, that he thought uh, were, 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 were issues. So um, uh, I, I don't know much more I can say than that. It reminds me of that joke, like our system is the worst except for every other one that's been tried. Yeah. <laughs> Let me give the, uh, the okay. student back here, uh, the GW student, for our last question. Okay, I want to thank the panelists for your informa informative presentation. And I am Delilah from uh, George Washington University. I'm concentrating on public diplomacy. So I have a question for all the panelists. Uh, I think from your presentation, you all have identified a specific target target public, like in the cases of Bahrain and Iraq, is the youth and the elites who have <coughs> access to the internet and who uh, actually know how to use social networking websites. And for Turkey, I think is uh, the socially and economically disadvantaged uh, youth. And for uh, Pakistan is the uh, illiterate that you care most about. But uh, I want to ask, what, uh, what is the what is the reason for your uh, specific target public? And what about the rest of the public, like who have no access to the internet, like who are like the middle, middle class in Turkey, who are not identified as, as the disadvantaged ones? And uh, what's your um, plan to uh, approach the illiterate public in Pakistan? Thank you. I think you have a number of different programs that reach different audiences, but in terms of social media, I think she raises a really interesting point, which is that you have a skewed audience, and you've tried to address that, for instance, by publishing in Arabic, but even then, presumably, given the demographics that you're looking at, um, or internet penetration or whatnot, maybe it's different in Bahrain, I'm not sure, but um, you're going to have these challenges. How do, you, how do you deal with that? I, I think in Bahrain, um, internet penetration actually is really high, and so using social media is a pretty decent way to get messaging out. Um, like I said, there was a pretty big upswing, and so people who weren't, you know, older generations that weren't on Facebook or weren't following Twitter before suddenly were, and so suddenly that opens up new avenues for communication. Um, but in terms of Bahrain, the, the target population that we were looking at for public diplomacy because uh, it was the youth because, um, let's be frank, we can't reach everybody all the time with the limited resources that we have. I mean, it is a question of, of where we focus our efforts. And so in Bahrain, based on what our national interests are there, it was more youth focused. And so while we found other ways to reach out through conventional media, um, and such, you know, and I'm speaking of my three years there, um, when you're trying to reach out to specific youth populations, it was best for us to, to do more online because that's where the young people were. Um, that didn't preclude us from going out to the universities or trying to be out um, outside the embassy either, but that's where our, our embassy focus was in terms of what we're trying to do public diplomacy wise. Aaron, last word? Or? Sure, I'd add to that. It's, and it's a great question. Um, yeah. And it's a great comment, and, and especially thinking of we, don't, we, we do want to target youth, we do want to target women, but what about young men? What about all the other folks? I, I think in the Arab world, um, television is just so powerful. Um, and and I, think that's, I think that's the case across the developing world as well. Mm -hmm. And so um, I know that um, every time I had an opportunity to get in front of the camera, not surprising. Um, uh, I, I took it, um, but because I knew that people were watching Al Hurra, Al Arabiya, Al Jazeera, and Al Iraqiya, and all of these stations, uh, and that using frequent media appearances. I mean, you know, I, I hate to quote Don Draper, but um, <laughs> but I will. You know, you know, for those who watch Mad Men, you know, he said a couple seasons ago, if you don't like the convers, if you don't like what's being said, change the conversation. And you know, I would get these interview requests to go on television and talk about this specific thing. And I'd say, great, I'd love to do that. Because all I'm thinking is, I get to talk about our cultural programs. I get to talk about Fulbright. I get to talk about all these other things that they don't even know I'm going to talk about. Um, so I, I think television, whether it's um, it, you know, in Pakistan, in Turkey, in Bahrain, in Al-Iraq, I mean, all of those places, that needs to be a place where we, we invest our efforts. Yeah, it's, a, it's an important 
reality dose to end on that traditional media and radio, uh, radio for zone. instance, uh, yeah. are very important. You know, we, I think we have a conference every three days around the world about social media in the Arab Spring, but at the end of the day, it was TV and radio and interpersonal communication that, that mattered uh, probably more than anything else. Great. Well, I, listen, that was a wonderful panel. Uh, I know we ran a little long, and so we'll have a shorter break, but it was great. Give me a little panel. Um, uh, please only take a short, maybe, uh, till. And now to the video. Everybody here knows the name Michelle Kwan. I'm sure you know her as a celebrated American figure skater. She's a nine-time U.S. champion and five-time world champion, both records that still stand. She's the only woman in history to reclaim the world title three times. She's won two Olympic medals. She's the most decorated figure skater in American history and one of the greatest of all time, but I'm sure you know that. Less well known, ladies and gentlemen, is her, are her other activities. Some of them are mentioned in your program. She has many of them. The one I want to mention here on this occasion is her work in public diplomacy. In 2006, she was named by Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice as the nation's public diplomacy ambassador. Now, the U.S. government has sent athletes abroad to coach and to, other, to do other athletic events, but this was a special change in our policy, and she is the public diplomacy ambassador who does much more than sports. She's continued in that role under the Obama administration. She regularly makes trips abroad to speak for America and to do public diplomacy tasks pro bono. In the video you're about to see, she explains her work in public diplomacy. This interview was conducted on September 21st, 2011 at George Washington University and will be included in the forum on the last three feet, new activities, new media, and new challenges for American public diplomacy. The, uh, Forum is hosted by the Institute of Public Diplomacy and Global Communication in George Washington University and the Public Diplomacy Council. Michelle Kwan's skills and ambitions took her to many parts of the world at an early age. Her talent, grace, friendly manner, and hard work earned her both championships and millions of fans around the world. Since November 2006, Ms. Kwan has truly become a world citizen whose travels as a State Department American Public Diplomacy Envoy have involved explaining American society, values, traditions to students and athletes and others from China to Argentina, from Korea to Russia. She has notable achievements in ice skating, winning 43 championships, including five world championships. She was as a member of the President's Council on Fitness, Sport, and Nutrition and as a student with a BA in International Studies from the University of Denver and an MA in International Relations from the Fletcher Law School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. Michelle, welcome. Thank you. Uh, Michelle, Secretary Condoleezza Rice in 2005 named you as an American sports, um, American public diplomacy envoy. Can you tell us a little bit about your exact duties and the, some, the audiences you met and what you told them about the United States, its people, and its values and institutions? Well, since 2006, um, when I was appointed, I've had some amazing travels all over the world. Uh, like you said, Argentina, Russia, Ukraine, Singapore, met amazing people. And I guess as a public diplomacy envoy, I have a couple of goals. Uh, first is to have a positive influence. Uh, to be able to share my story, the things that I have learned through sports, like hard work, dedication, focus, falling sometimes on the <laughs> ice and getting back up. And these are universal concepts, and I hope that these students can apply into their own lives. And I guess second is by that interaction, by having a dialogue, a conversation, not a monologue, uh, that we can... Uh, learn about each other. Hopefully they can learn about 
America, the U.S., uh, and sometimes they have misconceptions mm -hmm. about the United States. Sometimes they think of the U.S. and they think of Hollywood or they think of uh, New York. They think of, and sometimes even bad misconceptions uh, that I might be able to answer some of the questions that they might have. And also it's a chance for me to learn. Uh, I've traveled a lot of countries uh, through sports, through skating, but now as an envoy I get to learn and interact with people and learn about people from different cultures, different values, different traditions. Uh, so it's just been an incredible experience. Uh, in your travels abroad, you've been supported by uh, U.S. Foreign Service officers and their assistants who are citizens of that host country. I wonder if you could share an anecdote or two of some of the experiences you had with these Foreign Service officers, either in briefing you or attending one of your programs. The Foreign Service officers and the Public Affairs officers that I have met abroad are truly remarkable. They do an extraordinary job at representing our country abroad. Uh, they have language skills, they know the people that they interact with, uh, and they're so prepared. Um, I've had amazing experiences even through my trips as an envoy where they put together briefing books that are about this big, and I'm, I'm going, this is, it's only a week and a half trip, and yet there's pages on everything from the size, the population, uh, the food that people enjoy at that specific country. Uh, then it's more specifically people I'm going to meet throughout my trip. Uh, and then, of course, there's usually a, bit, a few hours of downtime where, like in, in Argentina, they scheduled an hour and a half of tango because <laughs> to experience the Argentine culture, you have to have tango in there. Uh, so it's incredible. They, they do an amazing job. Uh, you've traveled officially to China, Russia, Korea, Ukraine, Singapore, other places. Uh, these are very different societies. And I wonder what your impressions were of the people you met with, especially the students. And what sort of serious or humorous questions did some of the students throw your way? Wow. <laughs> I've had so many different questions from students uh, and government officials. Um, from students, I've had... Uh, a few in Russia, it was a very, very smart question. It says, do Americans think that in Russia there's bears running around? Mm -hmm. See, sometimes it goes both ways. Sure. Sometimes American students might have misconceptions of, of, Russian, of Russia. And I said, well, maybe, but I will help them understand, hopefully if I get a chance to meet these Americans, that uh, Russia's... There's not bears running around, uh, but also I asked, well, what do you think the U.S. is like? And it's like, well, taxi cabs, uh, lights, buildings, kind of the image of New York. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, yes, maybe in New York, but you might have the countryside in other parts of the U.S. You might have California, you have Colorado, the mountains, you have other parts of the U.S. that I try to uh, describe to them because I might be the first American right. that they ever meet. So it's important to be able to answer some of the questions that they might have. They're, they're curious minds. And I also encourage them to learn more about the U.S. and to even learn, learn English and, and travel in not just the U.S., but in Japan and Russia, learn about people from other societies. cultures because the world is getting smaller. I said, what happens if one day you'll be working closely with people in the U.S., working closely with people in Japan, working closely with people in Korea? You have to have that understanding. And the better the understanding, the better the relationship, relationship. will be. Uh, based on your international experiences and meeting with diverse groups of people, uh, do you have any recommendations or suggestions for those who will be in our forum audience as students uh, about uh, what they should consider if they're thinking about a career in international affairs, be it in the private sector or with the U.S. government? I think my advice um, is follow your passion. Um, I think 
having a curious mind is important, whether it be in the private sector or in the public sector. Um, if you're a foreign service officer, you have to be adventurous uh, to go from one country to another country to another country every few years. Um, and I think even in the private sector, there are times when uh, you, you jump from one country to another or you work directly for one country and then another country. So a curious mind in the sense that having an understanding um, with the people that you work with um, overseas, um, having the understanding in, in sort of broad scope uh, where they come from, um, cultural understanding, and also um, similarities. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what it's all about. It's all about building relationship from people to people, country to country. And I think that's essentially what, um, to me, my idea of public diplomacy is building that strong foundation, that friendship. Uh, finally, um, when you're not doing your envoy travels, what sort of things are you involved in now? Uh, I know that you, you have come to Washington as a, as a base for at least this time, period. And I'm wondering if uh, you could talk to us about some of the other activities you're involved in. Well, since I finished skating uh, competitively, I have that sort of curious mind where um, I continued my education. I finished at the University of Denver, then I uh, continued to get my master's at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, where I focused on foreign policy analysis. And now I made the move to Washington, D.C., and have continued to travel as a public diplomacy envoy and working with uh, the President's Council on Fitness, Sports, and Nutrition. Um, I'm also doing something with U.S. Women uh, China Lead, mm. uh, which is focused on U.S. and chi US China. Uh, so it's it's always wanting to learn, wanting to expand uh, my experiences and my knowledge. Um, and I guess continue on that path. Uh, a lot of people wonder, how did you go from figure skating to diplomacy? And they can't see that connection. But I can tell you that the experiences that I have gained through skating and traveling all over the world, it's really opened my eyes um, trying to understand and now through school and perhaps even a PhD, kind of flirting with the idea of a PhD, just having that idea of wanting to learn and wanting to, to understand. <laughs> um, I, one other question, if I might. Your parents, I believe, came from China, and you went there as an envoy. Did that particular trip have a great significance for you? I've traveled to China many, many times I and see. to Hong Kong. Uh, my parents are from Hong Kong, and I speak Cantonese uh, at home. And growing up Chinese American, I, I feel it, it was very, very special to me because um, I grew up understanding the Chinese culture, um, celebrating Chinese New Year. Uh, my family owned a Chinese restaurant, speaking Cantonese at home. But then at the same time, Born, raised, USA, nice. American. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I traveled to China, it was as an envoy. Um, it was definitely an amazing experience uh, to see it and to say, oh, wow, I'm representing the U.S. going to China. Um, and I just, I, I felt, wow, this is my parents, uh, when they immigrated to the United States, it's, uh, the land of the golden opportunity, uh, and and I think when I went to China, I was like, wow, everything my parents' dream um, came true. Very good. Well, we thank you for your time and your interest in our program, and wish you luck in your future experiences as an American public diplomacy envoy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Those of us in the public diplomacy community are delighted that Michelle Kwan has joined our effort. Uh, she not only has an internationally recognized name, she has a wonderful story to tell, she's inspirational, and I can tell you from personal experience, she's personally very, very charming. She was my student at the Fletcher School, 
and I'm pleased to know her as a friend. Michelle is right here in our front row. Would you like to stand up and say hello? Thank you, Michelle. And we're now ready for the second panel of the day. Good morning, everybody. Uh, once again, um, uh, my name is Mary Jeffers, and I am a State Department officer, but I'm on loan or detailed over here to George Washington University for the Institute for Public Diplomacy and Global Communications. And so I was thinking this morning, uh, it's an enormous privilege for me to have this position and to be here today. And I was thinking about uh, this morning that the same team of partnership that came together to organize this conference today is really the same team of partners that support the Institute for Public Diplomacy and Global Communications here at GW. And I'd just like to take one minute to thank some people in particular, uh, certainly Bud Jacobs, uh, Steve Chaplin, and, uh, and, our, and the other partners at the Public Diplomacy Council who are here today who have worked so hard on the program. Certainly the Walter Roberts Endowment and the remarkable uh, Mr. Walter Roberts himself. Um, and program assistants who really made it all possible, Lisa Hain from the Public Diplomacy Council, Derek Gilday at IPDGC, uh, Lily Ray and Jack Martin for the auditorium, and Roxanne Russell at the School of Media and Public Affairs uh, for video help. And so thank you to everybody, and thanks to all of you for being here today, and thank you to our next panel, all of you for making time to come here today. Um, I'd like to introduce very briefly um, the panelists, and following the model of the last panel, um, have everyone kind of go in turn, and then we'll do some questions at the end. Um, it's my uh, pleasure and privilege. Uh, le let me actually go in the reverse order of speaking, if I may, to introduce uh, Bruce Wharton, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs at, in the Bureau of African Affairs at the State Department, uh, where he comes after a long career uh, involved, uh, spent mainly in Africa and Latin American countries, or Western Hemisphere Affairs. Um, but prior to his current position, he also held senior positions in the Bureau of International Information Programs uh, in, in the department. Um, uh, Jean Maines is the director for resources uh, for um, uh, the Undersecretary for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs. Uh, Jean has one of those jobs where, like the old E.F. Hutton ads, you know, when Jean speaks, People listen, <laughs> but she's, <laughs> she's also um, has a career of over 19 years with the State Department uh, and has served in a variety of public diplomacy positions as well as uh, principal officer in the Azores. Um, but I think that we're going to hear mostly uh, about her experience as cultural affairs officer and the program stemming from that in Brazil today. Uh, Michael Anderson. Um, is a retired Foreign Service, Dr. Michael Anderson is a retired Foreign Service officer um, with over 30 years of experience working primarily in East Asia, but um, in other countries as well. Um, he comes with a, came to the Foreign Service with a very interesting background that involved a PhD in political science, a master's degree in journalism, um, experience working for UNICEF, and experience as a Peace Corps volunteer in Malaysia, very global and dynamic, and I think that um, he continues his work in retirement in the areas of um, uh, information and, and public diplomacy. Um, B. Camp is currently on a State Department detail to the Smithsonian, Smithsonian Institution, a great detail, as senior advisor to the Undersecretary of the Smithsonian for History, Art, and Culture. This is after most recently heading as, as a Consul General, the U.S. Consulate General in Shanghai, China. And I think a lot of uh, her remarks today will be about that experience, although she has also served overseas in Thailand, uh, Western Europe, and has held important positions in Washington on both the cultural and information side. So these are our panel. 
members, and again, thank you. And um, B, I'd like to ask you to begin, if you would. Thank you, and just, just about 10 minutes each. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was contacted uh, back in June when I was still in Shanghai by Jeremy Curtin and Steve Chaplin about doing a presentation today. And I consulted with my PAO in Shanghai and the PAO in Beijing. We all agreed that I should talk about the uh, U.S. experience of the Shanghai Expo last year. Uh, uh, this is not focused on youth or innovative approaches necessarily, although both of those play a role in the story. But just uh, to set the scene, in uh, mainland China, we have the embassy in Beijing and we have five consulates. So I was head of the consulate in Shanghai uh, since Ambassador Shannon mentioned that Sao Paulo is the uh, largest visa issuing post in the world. I'll mention that Shanghai is the fourth largest visa issuing post in the world. And when you uh, put China up against Brazil, China is the largest country issuing visa post in the world. So there is a huge surge. <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I have all those visa statistics in my brain still. But anyway, uh, so uh, public diplomacy in China includes most of the traditional programs that you all know about that we've been talking about here. We also reach millions of ordinary Chinese through our blogs, websites, and even Twitter, despite the fact that it is officially blocked in China. Uh, and active outreach units at the embassy and consulates increase our presence in the provinces as well. Programs in China usually need official government approval and are subject to Chinese government objections, cancellations, and misinformation. Nevertheless, we manage to do a lot within this re restricted environment and are reaching millions of Chinese online. Over the last year, our U.S. mission in China has built a significant online presence in China's large, carefully monitored blogosphere. The embassy and five consulates together maintain more than 50 Chinese language blogs and microblogs with roughly two million followers. Now, in the context of, I think, IIP's initiative to get four million Facebook followers uh, around the world, you can see how China, the, the numbers in China are always the large ones. So that's the backdrop, but on top of these everyday efforts, people to people diplomacy reached the biggest audiences I've seen in my career, and I'm talking real, not just virtual audiences, during a six-month period in 2010 through the USA Pavilion at the Shanghai Expo. Videos, exhibits, cultural programs, and American student guides at the pavilion offered 7.3 million visitors a face-to-face -face encounter with the United States. Uh, Michelle Kwan was featured in one of the introductory videos welcoming people to the USA Pavilion. Uh, the 7.3 million visitors in six months, now that I'm working at the Smithsonian, uh, I can give you another point of comparison. I recently saw the orientation video in the um, castle, the orientation video for the Smithsonian, which is narrated by um, Ben Stiller. Uh, and it mentions that uh, the most popular museum at the Smithsonian, Air and Space, uh, receives seven million visitors a year. So our USA Pavilion at the Expo received over seven million people in six months. Uh, for many millions of Chinese citizens, this was their first time to meet an American in person or to watch a video of President Obama welcoming, welcoming them to visit the United States. Now, I guess I should ask how many of you have even heard of the Shanghai Expo? Okay, that's better than expected. It wasn't well publicized here in the U.S. Did anybody attend the Shanghai Expo? Okay, we got one. Well, let me explain that Shanghai spent a decade planning the world, largest World's Fair in history, an event that would showcase the city in 2010 the way the 2008 Olympics showcased Beijing. There's a little Shanghai-Beijing competition here as well. In the end, the Shanghai Expo drew over 73 million visitors during May 1st to October 31st, 2010. A record 189 countries participated in the Expo plus 60 other groups. So the Shanghai Expo set out to break records, and it did. Although the U.S. has its own glorious history of hosting world fairs going back to the Philadelphia Centennial Exposition in 1876, we have had a spotty participation record in recent decades. A congressional prohibition on using U.S. government appropriated funds for such fairs made it nearly impossible to take advantage of the opportunities presented. In the lead up to the Shanghai Expo, 
The story became the fear that non-participation by the U.S. in China's big party wasn't going to go down well with the PRC government or public. In early 2009, newly appointed Secretary Clinton got the message and set in motion fundraising that made it possible to move forward on a USA pavilion. From this late start, we created a successful public-private partnership that presented public diplomacy on a massive scale and proved a bright spot in an otherwise testy year for U.S.-China relations. We built an entire organization in roughly 10 months, copied previous exhibition best practices such as the Student Ambassador Program, and took advantage of traditional public diplomacy tools such as support for performances and alumni programs. This is why I say this isn't necessarily about innovative programs. A lot of these are good old traditional ideas that we were able to throw into this situation. The public affairs section in Beijing, backed by Washington offices, was our partner throughout a long and ultimately successful effort that reached 7.3 million people directly and hundreds of millions more through media, social networking, and a virtual pavilion site. So let me list some of the wide-ranging accomplishments of the USA Pavilion. The pavilion helped U.S. municipalities and states promote investment in tourism as 10 governors. That would include Arnold Schwarzenegger, Tim Pawlenty, uh, Rick Perry, all came, and 12 mayors, including Mayor Daley, who brought a Chicago delegation, uh, came to the pavilion. Other U.S. officials who came included a four cabinet-level officials and 10 members of Congress. President Hu Jintao came for a look before the official opening, later followed by leaders from every province of China. We welcomed visitors from 100 nations, the European Union, and the UN. By going carbon neutral, the pavilion helped live up to the environmental theme of the expo, better city, better life. Our 160 Mandarin-speaking U.S. student ambassadors represented 38 states. Many took the foreign service test while in Shanghai, and I'm pretty sure a good number will go on to careers in the China field. Pavilion staff organized more than 1,000 cultural and entertainment programs featuring 150 different American groups, including four Grammy winners. We had Herbie Hancock, Dee Dee Bridgewater, um, uh, Harry Connick Jr., <laughs> Quincy Jones visited the pavilion. The pavilion promoted U.S. businesses and U.S. brands with 68 official sponsors and 16 official suppliers. The USA Pavilion generated more than 8,000 media stories in China, the U.S., and across the globe. The pavilion improved perceptions of the United States and promoted study in the U.S. I was recently told in one of the PDC meetings that uh, the University of Southern California experienced an eight-fold increase in applications. Uh, after the expo. USC was the uh, contractor for the student ambassador program. Welcoming as many as 50,000 visitors a day, the USA Pavilion provided an unprecedented opportunity to showcase American culture and values to the Chinese people. By the October 31 end of the expo, the USA Pavilion had presented America's story and America's spirit to more than 7 million visitors. In the words of one middle-aged woman from Nanshan, quote, the more we learn about American culture, the more we appreciate it. One blogger went so far as to describe the USA Pavilion as a mirror that allows the Chinese to, quote, see that the real shortage in China, as compared to the U.S., is the spirit of humanism, public consciousness, solidarity, and cooperation. While some visitors and officials said they expected more high technology on display and criticized us for it, for that lack, the main 4D movie about a small girl mobilizing her community to build a garden made a deep impression on most Chinese visitors who appreciated the message of teamwork, citizen involvement, and environmental awareness. Showcasing the United States in this way, instead of merely reinforcing the image of an economic and technological superpower, was one of the ways in which the USA Pavilion influenced Chinese perceptions of the US. A survey by Fudan University of Visitors exiting the pavilion reported increases in descriptions such as friendly and culturally diverse for the US. After the expo, our public affairs office continued to distribute DVD copies of the garden video. We even sent copies to Kabul at the request of the wife of Ambassador Eikenberry, who was moved by the self-help civil society message of the movie when she visited the pavilion. And since returning to the U.S. in August, I've been struck by the sight of community gardens in various parts of the U.S. I didn't even know this was going on, making me even more convinced that this theme tapped into an important part of the American spirit. So I stop, I'll stop here, but I look forward to the chance to answer questions about the Expo, the Pavilion, or other uh, public diplomacy programs in China. Thank you.
Thank you very much. First, may I commend all of the organizers for our meeting today for their focus on the field. I think it's very refreshing to finally attend a conference in Washington that does focus clearly on the field. And that's what public diplomacy is all about. What I'd like to talk about today is the entity mentioned on the screen in front of you, at America. And it is spelled correctly and should be a small a in America. This is a very exciting, new, and risky initiative started by the U.S. Embassy in Jakarta with the support of the department back here in Washington. It's been developing, evolving over the past year. Before I get into some of the details of the project itself, let me put the whole issue into bigger context. And that is the whole issue of American spaces, public diplomacy spaces, the places where public diplomacy can be conducted. For several decades, PD officers in embassies around the world had a very special tool. It was called the Cultural Center, the American Center. And this was a place that people could gather to build bridges of understanding with diverse local audiences. These were publicly accessible brick and mortar structures that strengthened understanding of US policy and society by providing physical space for opinion makers and up and coming leaders and students to exchange ideas with Americans and listen and learn from one another. At the typical American Center, those of you uh, who may recall what they actually looked like, you remember visitors could actually read US books and magazines, they could view films and exhibits, they could enjoy cultural programs, they could practice American English, and most importantly, they could actually meet a real live American human being. These time-tested American centers were very lively, and they were a recognition that the best way to engage audiences and promote mutual understanding was very simply through direct people-to-people -people interaction, what Ed Merrill called the critical last three feet of effective information and cultural efforts abroad. By the late 1990s, however, a combination of factors changed everything. The end of the Cold War, budget cuts, increased security concerns, the 1999 consolidation of USIA into the Department of State, changes in technology, and changes in the communication environment, and other factors led to the closure of numerous American centers and libraries. The result was that many public diplomacy officers were forced to work with both smaller budgets and reduced public programming space. And they had little choice, really, but to retreat behind high embassy walls. In the post 9-11 environment, especially security, of course, took precedence over everything. But not surprisingly, personal interaction and the building of continuity with elites and younger contacts became much, much more difficult. The quality and quantity of programming generally declined as people in droves stayed away from official US premises which increasingly were perceived as relatively isolated or unwelcoming or fortress-like. Despite pleas from many of our contacts and from experienced public diplomacy officers and ambassadors who understood the value of the human dimension in our business, those who set budget and decided space and security issues felt they had no alternative but to pursue policies which sent out a very clear signal around the world. And that signal was that the US could no longer maintain easily accessible places. After years of debate and numerous reports by one export panel, expert panel after another, after another, after another, this so-called PD space issue very recently has seen some encouraging movement away from a decade or so of neglect. Congress has shown some real interest in re-examining the PD platform strategy with the goal of re-establishing 
publicly accessible, appropriately secure American centers or other spaces. The then Undersecretary for PD and Public Affairs, Judith McHale, responded, I think, to this renewed interest and to pressures from the field to reopen the whole PD space debate. And she decided to support an exciting PD pilot project conceived by the embassy in Jakarta. On December 2 last year, during a trip to Jakarta, McHale opened at America, the world's first high-tech American cultural center in a commercial mall, something never done before. Recognizing that the diplomats needed to move beyond the walls of our embassy to speak with people from all backgrounds and walks of life, Undersecretary McHale funded the U.S. Embassy Jakarta at America project. She also established an American Spaces unit in the State Department designed to support the growth of a range of options for, D for PD space outside of embassies and to more actively take U.S. public diplomacy into the so-called marketplace of ideas. And more recently, a new Deputy Assistant Secretary level position has been established in the department to create and instill standards on PD spaces. Take a look at what kind of spaces the department runs today. It's quite amazing. It's a hodgepodge of PD spaces evolving in one form or another. Today, the U.S. operates 778 separate PD venues. That's hard to believe. 177 of these are information resource centers. 37 are more traditional cultural centers. A huge number, 436, are American corners. Tiny little mini reference corners squeezed into facilities outside of space controlled by the U.S. government. And finally, 128 binational centers, mainly in Central and South America. Now back to Ad America in Jakarta. Indonesia was an ideal venue to revitalize or more accurately reinvent the idea of the American center. Over the past decade or so, Indonesia had transformed itself from a military-run authoritarian state into a remarkably stable, stable, vibrant democracy. Not only was the embassy in Jakarta strongly behind Ad America, but Indonesia itself was ready for more meaningful interaction with America. This was clearly demonstrated by the U.S.-Indonesia Comprehensive Partnership signed by President Obama and President Yudhoyono in November 2010 when President Obama visited Indonesia. Those two leaders, one Indonesian, one American, realized the bilateral relationship deserved a much more respectful partnership and more strategic attention in the 21st century. Indonesia, after all, was the world's fourth largest nation, the world's largest Muslim majority nation. It was a moderate emerging free market democracy and with its recently acquired G20 membership and its influence in groups like ASEAN, the East Asian Summit, and APEC, Indonesia had become an increasingly important regional and global player. And you will see all of this in a couple of weeks when President Obama actually goes back to Indonesia for the first full U.S. participation in EAS, the East Asia Summit, which takes place in Bali, Indonesia, in a couple of weeks. Now, after more than a year of intensive Indonesian, uh, Indo intensive embassy whole of government planning and research, Ad America was opened in late 2010. Let me quickly just show you a few slides. Let's see if these work. Just to give you a glimpse of what this place physically looks like, real fast. That's the PAO, Don Washington, in the middle, talking about food with cooks at the American Center, at, at America. Here's a group of Indonesian students on one of our exchange programs 
all studying English, but what they're doing, they're at America learning how to use the iPod, iPad. Sorry. This is the membership counter. If you go to Ad America, this is where you sign up to become a member, and this is where you check out your iPod, iPad. Sorry. <laughs> Don't think we have iPods yet. This is very exciting. Ad America involves plenty of public-private partnerships, and Google was one of the first partners to lend their technology to Ad America. The technology was Google uh, Liquid Galaxy, which allows you a 3D type experience seeing parts of the United States. Very innovative. First time this technology was ever in Indonesia. And you can only see it at, at America. And finally, this is the most dramatic picture because it shows you what the public access space actually looks like. We can see 250 people in bleachers. The room is multimedia, and it, be con it can be configured in a number of ways to do all kinds of public programming and outreach activities. Today at America, visitors are welcomed to the venue by friendly young Indonesian-speaking e-guides, English and Indonesia, I might add, who invite visitors to explore, experience, express. Inside the space, guests are exposed to US technology, videos and photos, interactive games, and a variety of live programs designed to facilitate people-to-people -people exchange and create communities virtually and in real life. This multi-purpose area that you see in front of you, as I said, can seat 250 people on bleachers. It's flexible, everything moves around, can be uh, altered for different kinds of programming. And everything from guest speakers, performances, discussion, debates, master classes, video conferencing, et cetera, take place in that space. Also, Ad America has um, Education USA counselors available. So if you walk in, you can ta talk to a live human being and get advice about studying in the United States. And the reason for this is one of the major goals of the comprehensive partnership with Indonesia is to double the number of Indonesian students coming to America and doubling the number of Americans coming to Indonesia. So Ad America helps accomplish part of that, that goal. Um, I'm running out of time. I can, as I can see, let me go just to the basic question you're all asking. Has this experiment, this pilot project worked? Has it been a dynamic kind of PD platform that produces measurable results and improves relations? Has it effectively supported strategic objectives such as youth and Muslim engagement? The new Jakarta space called Ad America has only been opened for less than a year and it is still very much a work in progress and it still remains the only facility of its kind in the world. So it's still very much a pilot project and experiment. During its first six months, it attracted almost 44,000 visitors who attended one of more than 270 programs or received information from on-site educational advisors or learned about US society through various technology platforms. By July 2011, daily total visitors reached 368 people a day. Those are people that physically came into the facility each day. 70% were aged 15 to 30, and Ad America had over 14,000 website members, almost 12,000 Twitter followers, and about 3,200 Facebook friends. State Department is evaluating at America, of course. It's done extensive formal evaluations. Focus groups are positive about the quality and type of programming, programs, but they do reflect a desire for more quantity and depth of content to be made available to visitors and other users of Ad America. As anticipated, Ad America managers have had to work hard to promote the facility and have not depended solely on casual walk-in visitors from the mall or traditional elite audiences. 
65% of visitors have been event visitors. 35% have been casual walk-ins. Security arrangements an absolute priority for the new facility since day one have been responsible and adequate, but they have been somewhat offsetting to some of the attendees. My conclusion, Ad America needs more fine tuning. It needs sustained funding. It needs a steady supply of relevant, high quality and timely content. And it needs, of course, continued monitoring and evaluation and appropriate security. But it is clearly on track as a laboratory for the department to try new public diplomacy things and as an evolving model for a new generation of American cultural centers and outreach venues that PD practitioners and foreign audiences, many of you I assume in this room, have long been asking for or waited for. Indonesian and international media coverage of Ad America has generally been extensive and positive. And in strictly bilateral terms, there is no question but that Ad America has actively engaged new Indonesian audiences and has helped advance and highlight the broadening and deepening US and Indonesian relationship. Ad America is still considered a pilot project, as I said, although aspects of it, such as the mall location and the idea of a contractor staff are being considered by other posts. Finally, in today's challenging era of extremely, and I say extremely tight, 150 account, the International Affairs account at State Department. It very much remains to be seen whether the Jakarta at America facility, which cost a lot of money, will be a one-off experiment or will it be a real model for a different kind of public space over the long haul? As Ad America approaches its first anniversary in December and as the Department of State wrestles painfully <laughs> painfully with scarce resources, and continues to test ways to make public diplomacy more effective, PD advocates, hopefully everybody in the room, will wish at America the best of luck and hope it will succeed. Thank you.